It's Wrestling Observer Radio for Wednesday, May the 20th, 2020. I'm Jim Valley, along with Dave Meltzer and following the season finale of The Dark Side of the Ring. Joining us now is Dr. Martha Hart. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Martha, I just uh, I want to thank you for, for doing the show, obviously. And um, I guess we'll start just you saw the show last night um, and I saw it actually I saw it twice. I watched it again at one in the morning um, after I contacted you about it. But um, what, what's kind of like your thoughts now that you've seen it? Well, um, you know, it was very emotional for sure. And um, and although, you know, I'd had a hand in, in uh, just helping sort of shape the, um, the episode, I definitely didn't have c- uh, creative control. And so I was really pleased that um, that Vice Media and uh, the producers of Dark Side of the Ring, Evan Husney and Jason Eisner, they took the story um, in a direction that, you know, I, I hoped uh, that they would. But I wasn't sure how, you know, how the story would actually end up turning out. Um, but I was so pleased with it. And actually, it's a story that... Um, really should have been told a long time ago. And um, it's a story that I wanted out there for a long time. Um, but, you know, and I, I, I've had different people approach me in the past with very good intentions, but they could just never uh, get the, the project off the ground. And, you know, and a lot of it was because um, the WWE and uh, Vince McMahon, you know, they're, they're a powerhouse and they, uh, they have very deep pockets and they have a lot of um, influence in the entertainment world. And so no one ever wanted to tackle the project uh, because, you know, always uh, worried about going up against them. Um, but then Vice Media came along and they are such a powerhouse in the entertainment world. And um, they... They weren't worried about that, and and this is the first time actually that I've had that opportunity to really tell my side of the story in a big way and um, and visually because of course I wrote my book um, in very early days and everything is in my book, um, but you know I, I understand that not everybody will read my book and so this is really nice um, to be able to see it on the screen and have that level of impact um and just before i forget to just one thing i really want to thank everyone that participated in the episode and i was so pleased that they were open to sharing their experiences and their side of the story um which really helped consolidate you know what i've always said and i really appreciated that i appreciated that jim ross and and jim cornett and and jimmy the referee and the Godfather and D'Lo and of course um, Chris Jericho all came on and um, you know and, and spoke so eloquently about their experiences and and how it's affected them over the years and and um, I can't even express how much I appreciated that they did that and it really helped because of course you know I can tell the story but it was so nice to hear their side of things you know, and a lot of them were actually there that night um, so that really added to the detail and, um, you know, and just how, how impactful uh, Owen, losing Owen was. And so, so I was really pleased about that. <laughs> and one thing I should mention, too, just before I forget, um, there's a scene, too, where, you know, of course, when, when Owen died and I went to Kansas City, I'd gone up on the catwalk on my very first trip there, and I walked right to the spot where Owen fell. And um, and then when the case, uh, you know, was completed and I took my children to Kansas City, I took them to Kemper Arena and I took them up to the catwalk. And there's a space on the catwalk where you can walk where you're not sort of suspended over the arena. And that's where I took them. I didn't take them right <laughs> into the center of the arena, just so people know, because, you know, I am a parenting researcher after all, and so I wouldn't um, take my kids and put them at risk by, you know, letting them walk all the way, you know, across the catwalk. But just just to make that clarification. Yeah, you know, the piece really affected me um, more, and I was, you know, I was ready for it more than I expected, especially because... It's like you have memories of certain things, and I have a lot of suppressed memories of, of that day. 
um, just because it was such a, you know, just <clears throat> you know, everything that happened in that day, it brought it all back, and it was just so tragic, uh, um, you know, for the lack of a better word. And, and um, I think Jim Ross being on it really hit it for me because I just remember the moment actually before he he said that owen was dead and i was on the phone and i don't know you know how well you know um marcy engelstein um i'm sure you you know the name anyway um Mm -hmm. i was actually on the phone with her at that moment and brett was on the um brett was on a flight to los angeles so they nobody could contact brett and i just remember um and i was i was talking to so many people and so many people were in denial and so many people who loved home that were not in WWE at the time, which what's going on. And, you know, they just, it has to be a work. It has to be an angle. And I go, it's not an angle. He's legitimately in the hospital. Um, and, you know, and, and people were like, Terry Funk and I had a, a, a I don't want to say argument, but it was, um, it, he was, he was, it's, it's a work. It's got to be a work. And I go, Terry, it's, it's, I promise you. It's not a work. It's, it's got to be. He was in tears. He was just trying to convince him. He didn't believe it, but he was trying yeah. to convince himself because he couldn't handle it. And, you know, none of us really could. You you had to deal with so much from the death of your husband, and then immediately, you know, you, you had to suck it up, so to speak. And I, I thought it was really something, that statement that you made about you could have gone one way or the other. You know, one way and just you know, falling off the edge, so to speak, or the other way, which is, um, <clears throat> fight. And, you know, you had to fight this, you know, there were so many aspects of that fight that I don't think people really can truly understand. I, I can't say that I can, but I was, I know about it, you know, between uh-huh. fighting WWE and then, you know, the family situation and then the way that whole case came down. And in the end, I know, I know you wanted the court. I know you wanted it in court. I know you wanted the evidence out, and then it just, it just wasn't going to happen. And um, you know, I mean, you, you, you turned it into a positive in a big way, but still, I mean, at this point now that we're 21 years later, 20 years later since you know that the thing was settled, I mean, are you happy that it was settled, or do you still have that lingering? Um, thing you know I mean, and i know it's not the money at this point but just that lingering thing in you of we didn't get it to the court so to speak well um you know there was so much to this case that i think you know people i don't know if they really understood um just the the egregious negligence that was that that was involved in this case and if you look at how, um, you know, um, the WWE had hired really top quality riggers in the past. They, this, there was a fellow, his name was Joe Branham, and he'd rigged Owen before. And, um, you know, when a proper rigger does a stunt, uh, there's two things that they always make sure of, that, that there's redundancy and that the talent never has control of the stunt. So neither of these things were done in Owen's situation. Um, You know, there was no redundancy. And on top of that, they were saying, you know, you don't pull this cord until you get to here. And, you know, and and that's just so inappropriate. Then on top of that, um, the equipment that was used was was completely inappropriate. The harness that <clears throat> that was used in the stunt, it was a stunt harness, but it was meant for dragging people behind a car. It wasn't meant to suspend someone 80 feet above the ground. <clears throat> and so what was happening to Owen as he was sitting in the harness was he was actually, you know, um, he couldn't breathe and it was cutting off the circulation as he was suspended there. And then, of course, um, the ridiculous clip that was used, that was a clip that was meant for the sole use of sailboats 
um, it, it by its very design, it was designed to fail in this type of a stunt for sure because the the design of the clip is it's meant to release on load. So the fact that Owen was hanging on the clip made it even that much more likely that um, it would open spontaneously. And um, and I know in the episode, you know, I had the clip and I showed the clip because people should see that this clip, when I said it was the equivalent of a paper clip, I meant it. And you could see how, uh, you know, flimsy and just inappropriate it was. And again, it's not meant for human use. It, it's meant for the, you know, use on a sailboat. So, so there was, you know, there was this um, whole issue of the most inappropriate equipment used, unqualified riggers, and um, and all this was done to have this, you know, this effect where as soon as no one hit the ground, then he would be quickly released. And uh, then he could just go on and, and wrestle. But but the WWE, they've been told before that, you know, this isn't a safe way to do the stunt. And, and qualified riggers like Joe Branham said, no, you know, we don't do it that way and we won't do it. And, um, and then on top of it, you know, they didn't like that top quality riggers they're they're pricey too they're expensive so um so they cut costs and they tried to do a stunt that was you know they were pushing for a stunt that wasn't safe to do and owen you know working for a billion dollar company never ever questioned his safety he thought there's, you know, of course this billion dollar company is going to um, make sure that I'm safe at a minimum. And of course that wasn't the case. Um, the other thing that I think people never realized is that, you know, how ugly this fight was for me against the WWE. They are a, a massive company. They have very deep pockets and they were going to stop at nothing to try to intimidate me and, you know, just chop me off at the knees. And so, um, you know, throughout that, the process, what they've done is they, um, they, were, they decided that they were going to sue me in Connecticut for breach of Owen's contract because um, in Missouri, where we'd filed the wrongful death lawsuit, uh, they, they award punitive damages. And um, and they were very worried, the WWE, about the punitive damages. If the, if, the, if the case had gone to trial, that was a big concern for them. So they were suing me in Connecticut to try to evade this, you know, scenario where they would have to pay punitive damages because in Connecticut, they, they don't allow punitive damages. And so um, I had to actually go and hire a whole legal team in Connecticut and fight that lawsuit at the same time that I was fighting the wrongful death lawsuit in Missouri. So that was just beyond the pale that they would then sue me, the widow, um, you know, for breach of Owen's contract when this wasn't about Owen's contract. I wasn't suing them over Owen's contract because they had a stipulation in the contract that all lawsuits had to be uh, taken up against them, had to be in Connecticut. But, you know, that's not what I was suing them about. I wasn't suing them for breach of Owen's contract. Um, so anyway, that was, you know, um, definitely one of the first salvos that they'd thrown at me. But then also to, you know, um, it was so heartbreaking, the manipulation of the Hart family, um, because then that resulted in some of the members working against me, stealing legal documents and giving them to the defense. And it was like they had our playbook, you know, and the betrayal that I felt, you know, it was, it was very crushing for me. Um, and then other members, they were silent, and that was equally painful in a lot of ways. Um, so, you know, I, 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 now looking back at it, of course, you know, like I've said many times, that, you know, I've forgiven them all. I wish they'd had the strength um, to stand with me in that fight, but, you know, they didn't, and that's really unfortunate. But I want to say that, you know, um, I, I forgave them all a long time ago. And we've all moved on and got, like, me and my children are, have moved in a very positive direction. But, you know, I really do wish them all the best because 
I trust me, I know how tough life can be and how hard it can be. And I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I don't wish harm on anybody. I truly hope that life has been very kind to all of them. Um, But at the same time, you know, I think it was important that people know this story. And, um, And I'm really happy that, like, People have that, I think they get that message that, you know, um, how awful the story was. I want them to take away, too, that, um, you know, there's there's positive things in this story, too. And a lot of that comes through the good work that we do through the Owen Hart Foundation. And, um, and that is the true spirit of Owen. You know, um, just everything the Owen Hart Foundation does is just a reflection of how what a wonderful person he was and and I'm glad that people got to see that and I'm really happy with the episode that you know everybody knew Owen as the wrestler and that's okay but this episode really gave them a window into the man the person that he was and you can see from watching the episode that you know how lovely he was and how happy and we had this very happy life and it was uh, you know he, he was just such a terrific person, and everybody loved him. And, um, you know, so it, it's nice that, that people got to see that. And I was really happy for the fans, too, because, you know, Owen loved his fans. He was actually, I bet you out of any wrestler, um, maybe out of any entertainer, he had such a good relationship with his fans because a lot of the fans, he he actually befriended, you know, they'd pick him up and they'd, you know, pick him up at the airport and he loved people and he, um, you know, he loved real people. He loved genuine people. Um, and he spent a lot of quality time with his fans. And so um, he never had that sort of like, um, you know, perspective that there was this barrier that, you know, I'm over here, you're over there. He just looked at everyone as a person, you know, and he thought everyone had value and um, and that's how he approached people. So I think he, because he was so approachable and so likable, um, you know, it just, it was easy. And, and he honestly enjoyed spending time more with the fans than he did definitely than with the people that he worked for. What was your emotions like and the decision-making of going to mediation, settling? um, Because, I mean, any any lawyer would tell you to settle. That's kind of like what lawyers do. But at the same time, your your motivation was very different from most people who were involved in a case like this. And I've been told that kind of from... You know, I mean, and I think I think to an extent, Brett, too, you know, I know because Brett was very supportive at that time in your life. I mean, this thing to me, in a sense, almost started at Owen's funeral because it turned into a television event. And I think that that Mm -hmm. was exactly what you didn't want. I mean, I remember from from that Mm -hmm. period was like I watched I watched the thing on television. And at the same time, I had already been told that that you did not want this thing on television, and there it was. Yeah, I know. Well, this is this was always the problem with the WWF at the time. Now, E um, was the incredible lack of respect um, for Owen and for me. And you know, um, it, well, and you're right. Well, it started even before the funeral because, of course, you know that um, when Owen fell to his death and he died in the ring, they just scooped him up like he was a piece of garbage and hauled him out of there. And then they paraded match after match onto a canvas that had Owen's blood, but also the, the boards under the, under the ring were broken. And there was a dip in the ring, and the wrestlers could feel where the dip was. Um, you know, and so, again, just that lack of... Um, you know, regard for human life. Uh, that was that was just the first sign of what I was dealing with. And then at the funeral too, you know, I invited them. I wanted them to come. I wanted Vince McMahon and his family to come. I promised Vince that, you know, if he if he was to come, that I would treat him with respect and, you know, that he didn't have to worry. I wanted him there, but I requested please don't take any footage of the funeral. Just come as a guest because that's, I've invited you and I've invited your company. And, 
And I, I stuck to my word. I greeted him. Um, I was pleasant to him. And then that night, um, you know, all I saw was footage of the funeral all over his show, and they were making money off of it. And, you know, then it, it, that, it just, all their decisions were so bad, so poor, you know, right from the start, just getting Owen off the ring and, and just making sure they didn't have to stop the show to, you know, because they didn't want to be at risk of losing a single penny. And then, you know, making sure that they had their camera crews there to, to get that footage and, and broadcast it and make more money. And, you know, that's all they cared about was money, money, money. And yet they couldn't even spend the money to make sure that Owen was rigged properly. So, you know, all the way through the, the lack of, you know, the lack of respect. And then on top of it, how awful they were to me, you know, suing me and manipulating Owen's family. And it just, it, it was just so awful, all of it. Um so, you know, I there there's just so many layers. And then, you know, even on top of it, I remember that they had gone to the newspaper and they said that they paid for Owen's funeral, which they did not. They paid to come to the funeral, um, like every other person, but they certainly didn't pay for Owen's funeral. So, again, it was, you know, just, just this constant, you know, and, and I'll tell you, WWE, they are a PR powerhouse. You know, um, they they could get their message out fast and quick, and it was like lightning. I'm one individual too, you know, and and I'm from Canada, and you can imagine the fight that I had in Connecticut and in Missouri, and I'm all the way from Canada, so that was a lot of work for me always to be traveling to these places, and and I I went to every deposition. I sat through every deposition. The only one I didn't sit through was the medical examiner. But I read every affidavit. I studied everything about this case. Um, you know, and it wasn't about money for me ever. I've always wanted to go to trial because I wanted accountability. You know, I wanted the truth to be known. I, I wanted that out there. And, you know, as we sort of went through the lawsuit and and all the WWE was always trying to do was just muddy the waters, muddy the waters, get away from the actual case of what actually happened. And they were doing a good job of it because they were, you know, detracting from the case, like with these, um, you know, sort of like red herrings like oh we're going to sue her over here and that'll like then they'll have to deal with that and we'll manipulate the family and we're going to then they'll have to deal with that and just making it such a mess and so then what was happening because my my lawyers you know like you said normally lawyers they think well this will settle my lawyers were trial lawyers but you know, of course, as a lawyer, they always are hoping that, you know, they can resolve the case and they don't have to go to trial. Um, and my lawyers were no different. They were always approaching me and saying, you know, about like, gee, like, should we put a number on the table? And I told them in no uncertain terms, don't even ever bring that up to me. And they knew it was, they knew that my mindset was that, no, we are on the road to trial and there's nothing else. There's nothing that's going to stop us from achieving that goal. And so, but the problem is that um, even if you go to trial, you should put a number on the table because when you do that, then the interest starts running. And so my problem was because I told my lawyers never, we're never putting a number on the table. So then the defense, they could delay. They they kept delaying, delaying because they had nothing to lose, right? So and this is what my lawyers were saying. Like, And then I thought, geez, it's almost like, you know, um, they're laughing at me because I won't put this number on the table and they can just afford to delay forever. They have the deepest pockets they can drag this on forever. So then as a strategy, I said to my lawyers, let's put a number on the table, which was a very extremely hard decision for me. But I said, I'm only doing it as a strategy to stop them from delaying this case. And so we put the number on the table. And so what happens is they'll have 60 days to accept that um, like number as a settlement. And if they don't, then once they don't, then, then it's like the, 
the, you know, the, the timer starts ticking then. It's like now, now you're accruing interest on that amount that's been put on the table. So when we got to the 60th day, um, you know, I never thought they'd accept it, the, accept the, the number we put, but then I got worried and I panicked because I thought, oh my God, like, what if they actually um, accept it and, and then they, we settle and then this is over and where's my justice? And, um, you know, because again, you know, I had this mindset that we needed to go to trial. And um, and that's what I was thinking that, you know, um, I've, I've gone through all this and where's my justice going to be? Because I looked at settlement like a failure. You know, it's like, no, this needs to go to trial. Like anything less than that is a failure. So then I phoned my lawyer and I said, I, I'm worried. What if they accept this? Then where's my justice? And she said something that that just shook me to my core and something that I, I didn't ever even think of and she said to me Martha at the end of the day no matter how this thing ends it's always only going to be about money and I said what and then she said well you know no one's going to jail nobody gets convicted at the end of it this is this is all it's about is money and when she said that you know I never thought of it that way because I always just was thinking I want to go to trial I want justice for Owen. I want accountability. And when she said that, it was, I never felt such despair in my life that, you know, I thought all this work, everything I've done, this is all it's about is just money. At the end of the day, it's just going to be a check. That's it. And so then at the same moment when I literally was at the bottom of the barrel, then I don't even know where it came to me, but I was just like, like a flash of light. I was like, you know what? I know what I'm going to do with this money. I am going to start a foundation and I'm going to create my own justice. If I can't get the justice I'm seeking through the legal system, I will create my own form of justice and it's going to be beautiful and it's going to be bright and it's going to be positive and it's going to reflect everything that Owen was. And, and I thought like, I don't know anything about starting a foundation at all, but I'm going to, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. When this is all said and done, I'm going to take that money and I'm going to start this foundation and, and that's going to be my justice. Um, you know, like success is the best revenge, right? And so then, um, then you know what, it was like a, a weight had been lifted off of me because I, I thought no matter how this ends, whether we go to trial or if it settles, then I know what I'm doing after this. And so then then it just changed my view and it made it okay that I could settle this case. And then because then I was like, I know what I want to do. I want to do something so great and I'm going to create the most beautiful thing. So that was that's what happened. And then you're right, like you mentioned, Brett, and he was very supportive and I always appreciated that. I still appreciate it to this day. Um with Brett, we had, um, you know, through the lawsuit, he he wasn't friends with Vince at the time. He he was like in a big battle against him over the whole Montreal thing, and he had come to us and, and you know was asking if we settled this case ever, like that we could get his wrestling footage included in the settlement, which was, you know, an odd request. But I didn't think that was even possible, but. You know, I appreciated his help and, and you know, I, I wished I could have helped him back. But when that didn't happen, um, because, of course, this was about Owen's, this case was about Owen's life and death and the negligence and it wasn't about Brett's footage. But when that didn't happen, then Brett got very upset with me. And um, and it was hard. You know, I remember I cried when he yelled at me about it and um, and you know, I, again, like if I could have helped him, I would have, because I, to this day, you know, I always appreciated that he helped me and he did help me and it, it, it meant a lot. Um, but then after that, I think his footage mattered so much to him because, you know, he, he, he wanted that, um, legacy and, and, you know, and he was a very good wrestler and I knew that wrestling was, uh, you know, so such a big part of his life. And, uh, so anyway, um, as it turned out, then he went and befriended Vince 
um, you know, and he did tell me once, he said, you know, if I ever befriended Vince again, my soul would shatter. And, you know, but then, like, then that's what he did because he wanted that footage and he wanted that legacy. And, but then, and that's fine. It's like, you know, and he could have done that and, you know, got his footage or whatever. But then it just seemed like he sort of started turning, like, he turned towards Vince, but he turned against me. And then it became sort of this um, this battle where then he was trying to be an advocate for the WWE and, you know, really pushing to get Owen into their Hall of Fame, which, you know, I always said, like, that's never going to happen because these, this is company's responsible for his death. And not only that, the, just the level of disrespect that they've, continue to show like from start to finish it just it wasn't going to happen you know so so that's the unfortunate story um with brett that you know um things really shifted with him and uh you know but again you know uh brett he did he really helped me and i i don't care what his agenda was i'm always going to be grateful that he did help me and I wish the best for him, too. But, you know, you can forgive people, and I have, like I said, forgiven them all. But that doesn't mean that you have to have a relationship with them. And, you know, I I see the Hart family, and when I do, I'm always polite. And, you know, this was a family I cared about at one time, and, you know, and I still care about them, and I still wish the best for them. So, you know, and I tell my kids that too, that, you know, if you see them, you be polite and you be respectful. Um, because I think no matter what people do in life, you should always, you know, just it doesn't hurt to be nice to people regardless. And, you know, at the end of the day, what's done is done. And unfortunately, the damage is done and it's irreparable. We can't have a relationship because, you know, like any relationship in life, once you break the trust, you have to have trust in order to have a relationship. So, so you know, that, that, like I said, it's sort of the casualties of war, and it, it's just unfortunate that it all happened that way. And But the whole story is unfortunate, you know. And, I mean, I think because I like, I like to look at the positives, and I think there are still a lot of positives, and definitely the Owen Hart Foundation is a huge positive. Kind of tell us about... The Owen, you know, the the goals of the Owen Hart Foundation, and the fact that you know you use essentially you use the settlement money to help people get into homes, get into colleges, things like that. Well, you know, um, education was always really important to me and Owen, and um, so that sort of like I thought, well, I want to make that our mandate, um, education, and have it sort of be the umbrella of the foundation because you can fit a lot of things under that umbrella. And uh, so we provide, we have, well, we have three signature programs. So we provide scholarships to, um, uh, to individuals in need. And then also we have a housing component where we help people to purchase homes. So we literally give them the down payment to purchase a home, but they have to go through a two year financial literacy program um, just so they can learn how to like budget and, you know, save their money and what, what home ownership means. And, you know, there's a lot to owning a home too, you know, and how to, budget for all the things that can happen <laughs> like when you own a house things breaking down whatever but um so then we have that component and then we also have a partnership um component which uh is amazing because i love to collaborate with um other organizations and so we've been able to do so many great things we help um schools uh, all over the world um, we partner with For the Love of Children Society. We partner with Amnesty International. We partner with the Calgary Zoo. Like, we just have endless partnerships, and they're fantastic. We love the partnerships. So we're able to do so much good. And, you know, my son, um, he's a lawyer, and he's um, he's actually, while well, he's doing his master's in international law in England, but he's back in Canada now because of COVID, but um, he wants to pursue human rights law. 
And uh, so we have a whole like portion of the foundation that really reflects that. So, you know, we, that's where we partner with Amnesty International. But then my daughter, she's a journalism graduate and she writes for this really cute um, animal magazine. <laughs> she has an animal humanitarian uh, column in the, um, uh, in, in the magazine, but so we have a component too where we really support um, animal rights. So we partner with the Calgary Zoo. They have a conservation program, and and um, you know, so so it's nice because my I had kind of like uh, like basic needs interests, right? Um, and even we have a, a fund um, at the uh, Alberta Children's Hospital where, you know, we help families with basic needs. Like um, if they go to the hospital with their sick children, but they don't have the money for a hotel or for food, or, you know, um, our fund takes care of things like that, basic needs. So I was always sort of about like, I want to help people like at the ground level. But then, you know, my kids came to me and they were like, you know, mom, there, there's so many other really great causes like, you know, my son with the human rights and my daughter with like her animal rights and um and even the environment such a big you know cause right now and all really amazing so we've kind of expanded our vision again it's all about education because you know education is power you you inform people and you know and it's even like getting back full circle to our episode you inform people and you show them you know, and then then they know, you know, once you know, you know. And so um, so I really I think education in all forms, whether it's sort of academic or in trades or whatever, it's such a positive thing. And um, you, you can never go wrong, you know, um, being educated in any form. So we really support that. Um, and that's sort of like our like I said, our umbrella and, um, you know, and, and that's the nice thing too, I'll just mention about our scholarship program. We give bursaries and my whole thrust was that we lowered the bar. So if kids in high school, if they get into any program, um, they can apply for the scholarships. So, um, so we don't make it where it's, the most scholastic kids because the whole point was to encourage kids that you know what yes you can go to university and you can get um scholarships to go even if you're not getting 90s in school if you just even get accepted into anywhere even a trade school or art school or anywhere um you know uh then that's great and we will support you so the the scholastic kids are always going to find scholarships they will it's the kids that are just you know right like at the bar that they have a hard time finding funding and that's a shame because you know um lots of kids too these days they have to work you know they work part-time or they help their families and if um if they have a job then they can't dedicate all their time to studying so they're not the kids that are going to get the 90s not that they couldn't but they just don't have the time so we really wanted to catch those kids like a safety net you know and be able to say like yeah we got you and you know you you go to school and you know get your education and you can do it so it's it's about not just rewarding the best, but it's about encouraging others to, you know, reach their full potential. When you look back, the stuff with um, OJ and the trains and everything, you know, it's just, <laughs> you know, in many ways heartbreaking because I think uh, I mean, one of the things in wrestling is, is <clears throat> there have been... There have been a lot of tragedies in wrestling, not as many in the last few years, but there was a period from... You know, for decades where there were, you know, it was one after the other after the other. And, and Owens, you know, to me, Owen was always like the different one because so many of them were, were you know, drug-induced and things like that or party-induced or whatever, which, you know, and Owen was, you know, Owen was not that guy. And Owen's situation was, you know, 100% unavoidable. It was a stunt that had no business. It never should have been done. When it was done, it was negligent. It served no purpose. You know, whatever the motives were, yeah. were, were bad motives anyway. Um, and then, you know, everyone, you know, I've, I've known from other from other families that have, that have gone through this, you know, that everyone, you know, they're sad about the wrestler and this and that, but they don't realize that so many of them left young kids behind. And, mm -hmm. you know, when, when I saw, you know, um, Oge, you know, you know, again, at seven, you're going to remember stuff. And and you have the footage and everything, and it was really, really was a heartbreaker. And with Athena, you know, at three, right when when Owen died, mm -hmm. I mean, it's like 
I mean, I, I, I couldn't even remember anything in three. And I mean, it's just so, you know, and Owen, you know, you could see, and I, I knew him a little bit, as you know, um, he yeah. was a, he was a fun guy. He was a good, he was a good hearted guy. Um, and, um, I, you know, I was actually, the first time he was in WWE as the Blue Blazer, so this would be like the late 80s, I think I was with him the night that he decided to quit because he was in his hotel room with me and one of my friends, who was a better friend of Owen's than I was, when he called Stu and pretty much told <laughs> Stu, you know, that, that, that you know he was going to quit and he was, you know, kind of talking to us about going to Japan, you know, and wrestling in Japan, and that was kind of like what he wanted to do, and he wasn't really happy in WWF at the time. And, and a funny story is his own often room with the Ultimate Warrior, and he was telling <laughs> us, like, funny Ultimate Warrior stories and everything. And Ultimate Warrior was like, you know, how about, you know, like, you know, like, you know, could I go too? You know, which is funny because Ultimate Warrior had so much success about a year later, and, and, and was already on that verge already. He was already a big star in WWF by that time. Um, and Owen was like, because Ultimate Warrior was not a, a great wrestler. Owen was a, obviously a fantastic wrestler. Um, and he just goes, you know, Jim, you know, Japan's not, not for everybody. You know, trying to, you know, tell him, you know, kind of like, you know, it probably wouldn't be best for you, but it is best for me. But but Jim was, was very much, you know, interested in, in going to Japan, and you know, which is a, just an interesting footnote in wrestling history, because I remember when that, when that all went down. But... Um, you know, like, you know, I, I just felt so bad for your daughter, especially in the sense of, you know, she had this dad who loved her, who was a great guy, you know, and, you you know, she was robbed of all the things that people expect, you know, that, that kids grow up with, with, a, with a cool dad, you know. So yeah. that, was, that was like really heartbreaking to me watching the show last night. Well, you know, um, for me as a parent, I think... Um, that's the the saddest thing for me is that, you know, when, when something terrible happens in, in your life as an adult, um, you go through it and it's sort of situational, you know, you go through that hardship, but then, you know, you recover and you, you know, you hopefully come out of it better. But with kids, when something so traumatic happens to them, um, that has lifelong effects. You know, and so that for me as a parent is is the saddest thing. And, you know, what also is sad is I when I look back when, you know, when Owen was here and we were a family um, and, you know, I was such a like a happy mom. And, you know, and then when Owen died, it um, it changed because then it, it was just me. And so then, you know, you carry all that worry because I always thought, well, you know, um, I, I have to make sure that these kids turn out good because it's all on my shoulders, you know, that um, if they don't, then, then it's going to be all on me because all, I'm all they got. And, uh, you know, and that was a really hard thing, too, because sure, they lost their dad, but then also, too, um, my attention was divided, you know, when I had to go through the whole court case and everything and, and not to mention, um, you know, how sad I was about everything that I was dealing with, too. So it was really hard to, um, you know, and I, I did, I really tried to make sure that the kids didn't like necessarily see that side, but at the same time, you know, it, I didn't want to, um, let them think everything was okay either because it wasn't. And so they, they were aware that, that things weren't good and, and all of that too. But, but that's the hard part too, for me is that, um, you know, and I know this just because I'm, I'm, that's my job in real life. That's my doctor hat that I wear is, you know, I'm a parenting researcher. So I know that, um, kids, they, they'll like if you have two great parents, that that's the ultimate thing, you know. And but you know you can have one great parent, and that will get you through. And I know that too. <laughs> so, um, but you know that that's the hard part for me is that I know that like my kids, their lives would have been different, and um, 
You know, I think that they would have similar personalities, but, you know, I, everything affects people. You are, you know, what your whole childhood is, too. It's all rooted in, it's all into how you develop and shape and everything. Um, but they were robbed of that. They were robbed of um, of having a wonderful dad because he was an amazing father. And, you know, it's sad to lose a parent, but it's it's, just tragic to lose a wonderful parent and he was and he was such a great dad he just he loved being a dad he loved all the the kid stuff you know he was like a big kid it was like having three kids because you know um he loved to play and he was always like that was for him that was golden time was spending time with the kids and that was our life you know we did everything with our kids we we took them everywhere um you know there wasn't we never went on a trip without our kids we took them even as babies oh just first trip he was just four weeks old we went to indianapolis (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, and Athena, too, like we traveled all the time with the kids. We took them in everywhere to Germany. Well, and you saw the footage of Oge in Japan, <laughs> you right. know, so footage, they yeah. were like, um, you know, yeah, there was no divide. You know, we were like a united family. And, um, you know, and then and I'm glad that they um, like Oge really has a lot of memories with, with his dad. And because he was that much older and, you know, he really um, like things stuck. And because we, you know, we had such good quality time and um, and and maybe, too, because Owen, you know, he wasn't there all the time. So then Oge really had has vivid memories of, you know, the time that he did spend with dad because that was precious. And Athena, unfortunately, you know, she was so young that she does have some memories and she she definitely um, remembers, you know, uh, her dad with all the animals. And it's just funny how she's such an animal lover. She always was. She just always loved animals so much. But like, so it's nice that that's what sticks out to her is, you know, all the animal stuff. And, you know, and it's funny that little clip of her on the horse, because then when she got older, she actually was an equestrian rider and she was really great at riding so but now she's kind of shifted now she's kind of like well I don't know if the horse really wants me on its back (laughs) so you know but at the time she was a great she was a great rider when she was like you know in high school and stuff so for for you I mean like a lot so much of this I mean when I look at the situation from 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 you you lost a lot. I mean, you know, you, you have the memories of a certain number of years, but, you know, when it comes, you know, you, you know let's face it, you know, you were, you were robbed of a lot. I mean, um, you know, you can kind of, like, the kids are robbed of a lot, but, but you were robbed of, you know, whatever it is, 40 years, 50 years, you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, um, and that's got to be, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's you, know, you know, I don't know how to say it nicely, but... Uh, you know, I, I'm just trying to put myself kind of in your shoes. There's, there's, and and it never should have happened. You know, I mean, that's the other thing. Yeah. It's, it's just a such. It's you know, from your situation, you couldn't let it be the tragedy, but it was without a doubt. Yeah. No, it it really was, and and I guess you know, um, like I'd mentioned in in the documentary that you know when I lost Owen, it 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 was so devastating, and but I but at the same time it's like well I can't let everything that we had be for nothing, you know I I can't just let everything fall apart now. We had all these goals and all these dreams, and and you know and I guess um, for me I had sort of two separate lives because I had a life when Owen was home, but then I had a life when he wasn't home too. And so then that's like, it was lucky for me that I could just go into full mode when, you know, because I was already used to not having him all the time. And, um, but it was so hard because the thing was that, you know, when he wasn't home, it was all just the work stuff, you know, it's like just get all the, the tasks done. When Owen came home, it was the reward. Like, now it's family time, and now we're together. And then it just went from where I never got any rewards. It was just work, work, work. And, and you know, um, even, like, times when the kids were sick or, you know, you just needed that extra support, and it wasn't there, and that was 
just heartbreaking and don't get me crying now, Dave. <laughs> I'm already emotional. It's been a tough week. But, you know, um, yeah, like it was really hard. But, you know, then um, what I did was I decided that, you know, like I, I had other goals that I was working towards too. And I decided that, you know, that's going to be like I was working towards other goals that were kind of in slow motion because you know I couldn't I couldn't just go to university full time or things like that you know because it's like well you have a family and you have like you know other things that need attention and so then that's what I I did I shifted my focus and um, you know I was working on my education when Owen died I was at university and then I just put so much effort into that because then I decided that, you know, the career that I always wanted, that that's going to be my goal and my kids are going to be my goal. And I thought I only have one shot at being a parent and raising these kids properly and they're going to get all my attention. I'm not dividing it. It's going to be them and I'm going to focus on my career. So that's what I did. And um, I was really lucky that, you know, I got into Cambridge University in England. So we moved to England and we lived there for quite a, quite a, a bit of time because I did my master's and my Ph.D. there. And um, so that was really a great experience, actually. And it's nice because now Oge actually is in university in the U.K. too. So England's like second home for us, for sure. But then, you know, and I, I was lucky enough, I, I worked for the University of Cambridge for um, well about a year and a half. But then I wanted to come back home. And I was so lucky that, you know, um, as soon as I like I, I applied to, to one job at the University of Calgary and I got it. And that's where I've been ever since. And and it's wonderful because, you know, now for my career aspirations, <clears throat> um, I really feel like I've. You know, I've put my signature on the scientific community and um, our research team, me and my, my boss, Dr. Letourneau, we, we actually developed this incredible parenting intervention called ATTACH. And it was funded by um, Harvard University. And now we just um, received a, a very huge um grant from the Canadian government to scale the project across Canada. So for me, that's just incredible success, like on a sort of a a professional level. And yet, like it's still wearing that same hat of being able to help people. Um, So I I really love that, like all my layers in my life all sort of uh, intersect. And another thing I should mention um, that probably people don't realize is that uh, I'm such a movie lover, and I'm actually the vice president of the Monaco International Film Festival. It's the only film festival in the world. <laughs> yeah, and it's the only one in the world that it, it promotes nonviolence in film. So I love the film festival there, and I actually have a movie blog. And my movie blog, it's a really positive blog, and it talks about, like, it's just a fun thing, but it's, you know, my take on it is find the meaning of life through the movies you watch. So I write about movies. I do, like, a a review of sorts, but what I do is, you know, I say, like, what's the takeaway message of this movie? What does this movie hope you learn about life? Or, you know, um, so I always... um, you know, talk about like what you should learn by watching this movie. And then I always try to put a little personal element in if I can, like, well, I always do find some common thread with the movie and it's really fun. And I actually did a review on the docu-series on the, you know, Owen Hart's final days. And so I hope people go check it out because um, you know, I, I really think there's, you know, for all the sadness, again, like there's some really positive life lessons. And, um, you know, so go go check out the movie blog and, and see what uh, what I think the takeaway message is from my own docuseries. <laughs> so. I read it. No, I really oh, you enjoyed your analysis of a Groundhog Day. And I thought it was very poignant oh for everyone's lives right now. So. I enjoyed it. Yeah, exactly. Oh, thank you. That is so sweet. (laughs) So, well, you know, I love it and I love to write and it's just really fun. And, you know, I, I don't like, I don't rip movies apart because I always think, no, you know what? Every movie, even if it's silly or corny, 
corny or you know not well made or whatever like it, it, they have something to say and they're trying to they're just, that's what they're trying to do movies is convey a message you know what's the message right what what can you take away what was it like okay so so i know from when you were in with chris jericho and you mentioned one of your and owen's favorite movies was was father of the bride <laughs> which which is an interesting you know i mean but later you know, I you had you had Steve Martin perform for you guys for your fem- for your foundation, right? Yeah, we did. And you know what, my daughter, I have to tell you, she did something so sweet. <clears throat> she uh, she took the um, the DVD <clears throat> that um, we had, like a Father of the Bride, and she had Steve Martin and Martin Short because we had them both. And they're both in Father of the Bride. So she had them both sign the DVD for me behind my back and as a gift for me. So that was so sweet of her. So I have that, like, in, you know, my little office of memorabilia. Um, But, no, you know what? That's the other thing, too, that with the Owen Hart Foundation, every year we do a high-profile entertainer event. And we have had... So many amazing guests. So we just had our 20th anniversary, as you know, and we had Jerry Seinfeld um, for our 20th anniversary. We also had him for our 10th anniversary, and he was so terrific that I said every year it was kind of a running joke, you know, we need to get Jerry back for the 20th. And so we'd even tell his team, you know, like, don't come to Calgary because we want you back for the 20th, you know. And then, you know, but who knew if he was actually going to, like, still be performing. And, and you know what, sure enough, he was, and he came in, he did two shows. We were totally sold out. It was great. But we also have had incredible guests. Like, we had Robin Williams, which, oh, my God, like, that guy, he, he was so... So amazing. Oh, we just loved him so much. The realest guy on the planet. Like, just just incredible. But, you know, we had him. We had um, Ringo Starr, which I loved Ringo Starr. He was so incredible. And just the life he lived, you know, he's such an icon. And he was just lovely. And, you know, I mean, we have it all on our Own Heart Foundation website. Like, and I even did these, like, um, little sort of like blast from the past where I give like sort of viewers like extra little details about the event. Like, you know, we had Seth Myers who was great and he forgot his passport and he almost missed his flight and we barely got him in in time. Like, so I tell him like little funny stories, you know, but, um, uh, you know, Owen was such a funny guy. And that's the other thing, like everyone will tell you, like the prankster he was and you know, you brought up ultimate warrior and I have to tell you, he, he, Owen would, do this little trick on Jim. They'd be on a flight, and Owen would be sitting behind Jim on the plane, and Jim would fall asleep. And you know, he always like had his like had his like um, like he'd have not wrestling boots, but like cowboy boots on, you know. And he was always like looking like the part, right? And so Owen would take the peanuts and he would throw them into Jim's boot while he was sleeping. <laughs> and then Jim would wake up and he, his boots would be full of peanuts and he'd be like, Owen, like, I'm making peanut butter in my boots again because he, you know, but he would just see these little cranks that were, they were harmless, but, um, you know, he was always just joking around with people and just, you know, like he was just amused by you know, kind of pranking people all the time. And it's it's interesting because I remember saying to him very seriously, like, you know, Owen, you, you need to stop joking around. And he just looked at me with this funny grin. And he's like, I'll really try it. And I just thought, you know, what do you mean try? Like, you just don't have to do it. But he couldn't, you know, it was too big of an ask because that's who he was. He just was playful, you know, he's a playful guy. And he just liked to do these little silly pranks. Like I, I mentioned on Chris Jericho on his show that Owen would like take the tea bag, you know, and it's hooked to a little string and he would take it and he would tape it into the cover. And then when I'd open it, it would fly out at me and he did it because he knew I was like terrified of mice and and it was just you know uh, like he would do it just to get all that work just to get like a one second reaction you know and he would do it he was strategic you know he didn't do it all the time he would just when I wasn't expecting it then all of a sudden you know the tea bag would come flying out of the cupboard at me but um you know little things like that and I have to mention too with the um 
the Dark Side of the Ring episode, there is an encore presentation. I think they show it in about a week. It's next Tuesday at 8.30, just for people. Next Tuesday at 8.30. So it's worth the watch because there's an added four-minute clip of Owen the Prankster. And everyone, well, not totally everyone, but almost everyone in the, that, who's in the episode um, telling a joke that Owen played on them. So I tell it like something he did to me. I won't say it now because I want people to watch it, but it was just priceless. It's a really cute four-minute clip about Owen the prankster, you know, so it's worth a watch. When you started dating um, did, uh, at 15, did Owen or the family mm-hmm. protect the business around you? Yeah, you know, at, at that time, <clears throat> um, when I dated Owen, wrestling wasn't a big interest. And it, um, so I, I didn't really ask about it or anything, but I didn't actually know that it was like a setup because they were really good then about making it real. You know, like, like those guys, like they, they should have gotten Oscars for, <laughs> because they were so good at playing their roles of, you know, and um, making people believe that it was real. And so, um, I mean, I think people always like sort of suspected, but it's kind of like with boxing or whatever that, you know, like I think people accepted it generally that it was like for real legit. But um, but then there's always that possibility that with any kind of one on one sport, you could always rig it, I suppose. Right. So. Um, but yeah, there was a time when, you know, they really followed it through and, and, you know, they didn't let people know sort of the, the family secret, right? That it, the, the finishes were arranged and things like that. Do you remember when you got, as they say, smartened up? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, like I do remember, um, it was kind of like there was a conversation and, and Brett said to Owen, you know, is Martha smart? And then Owen said, no. And then um, <laughs> later I said to him, what do you mean, Owen? I'm not some bimbo. I'm actually quite intelligent, <laughs> you know. And then he it was, he had to tell me because, like, I was actually kind of, like, mad at him for thinking I wasn't smart. <laughs> and then, then he told me. And it was really nice, actually, because we were at a point, I guess, in our relationship that I took it as, um, you know, like like a real sort of level of trust that he would trust me with, um, you know, with that sort of information, right? And you know, and that's the thing though. With with when I met Owen, um, you know, we both sort of had a plan that we were going to go to university, and Owen was going to be um, he was going to be a school teacher. He wanted to be a phys ed teacher, and that's what he was going to university for. And he was actually he was a very good athlete, and he um, he was a four letter like Letterman, you know, because he played football and he wrestled and he also did track and field and rugby. And, but he got a scholarship to university of wrestling, an amateur wrestling scholarship. And, you know, his dad was such a lover of amateur wrestling. So Owen, you know, out of sort of respect for his dad and his dad was so proud that, you know, he went to university on, on the wrestling scholarship, but, you know, university is tough and, when you do a varsity sport, it's even tougher. And so it was hard for him to wrestle and then keep up with his studies as well. So he was in the wrestling business, or he was at university, and, and this was right around the time when um, Vince was buying up all the small territories. And they were trying to keep the business going. Um, Owen's brother, Bruce, was the booker. And um, so Bruce had come to Owen and said, you know, we're really like struggling and dad's hemorrhaging money and we really need some help. And, you know, geez, like you're so athletic and you're young and you're a heart and, you know, like that would carry a lot of weight. You know, do you think you could come and help dad and just, you know, help him even just for the summer or whatever. So that's what Owen did. That's sort of how he started in the business. And, um, you know, and, and of course he was a natural athlete, so he was very good at it. And he, growing up in the wrestling business, he really understood the philosophy and, and the psychology behind the sport and stuff. So 
but his intention wasn't to stay in wrestling as a career. Um, and he was often like always trying to get out of it for years. He, he applied to the fire department every year. And at that time in Calgary, it was really hard to get on the fire department. You had to have a university degree and he hadn't finished his degree because he'd gone to, you know, help his dad. And then it, it kind of picked him up and carried him away from his original goals and plans. Um, and so, you know, that was really crushing for Owen because Owen's brother was a firefighter and so was his brother-in-law. Yeah. And so he knew that life and he liked it. Like he thought that's the perfect life. You know, these guys are great. And it fit with his personality because Owen was a very kind, caring person, always trying to help people. And it really would have suited him very well. And he was a real sort of social guy. So, you know, how firefighters, they work four days on, four days off. And he would have loved that whole life of like living in the fire hall with the guys, but then coming home and, you know, and he was strong. He was a big, strong strong guy so he would have actually made a super wonderful firefighter but you know it it uh, he never had success like he would get to the he would get through the initial exams and he'd get to a certain point but then he never kept past that barrier because they'd always pick the guys that had like university degrees and that wasn't him and so um then another job that he tried he was a, an american citizen and a canadian citizen so the dual citizenship so he applied also at the um like to be a customs agent because in canada you know you have to go through u.s customs in canada so we have american customs agents that live in Canada, and he thought, well, that would be ideal because he's American as well as Canadian. And he could live in Calgary and work as an American, though. And um, and again, you know, no success. And so it, it was kind of coming to that point in our life, like, you know, he'd wrestled. It was always a good plan B because it was a good living, and, you know, it definitely provided a living for us. But he, he always wanted to sort of escape wrestling. And then it got to a point where he realized, you know, that it just wasn't going to happen anytime soon. So then we embraced it as, like, okay, well, you know, we had a plan, like, he worked for maybe another 10 years in, in the business if his body could put up with it. And then when he would be done with it, you know, he really liked to build things and he loved building bicycles. That was sort of his favorite hobby. And he, I actually have a bike in my garage right now that he built and it's, a, it's the cutest bike. It's purple and it has a basket and, and, you know, this is what he liked to do. He loved working with all the gears and the pedals and he would just take scraps and he would just, like, I don't know, it was like magic, you know, he just build a bike with it. And um, and that's what he thought. He would like to maybe open up a, a shop and, and that, you know, he would have a bike shop and he would just like tinker around and fix bikes and do this kind of fun stuff. And that's, we did a lot of biking too. Um, so, you know, so it was, that was sort of the goal for him. And, you know, that's like how life, picked him up and took him far away from his original plans, you know. When did you figure out, or did you see, because cause I remember, I remember Owen um, probably from, I, the first, his first week of television for sure, because I, I would get the tapes of Stampede Wrestling, and I re vividly remember because when Owen started, he was like the hot new thing in wrestling. You know, he was he was so talented from, from day one. Um, I mean, when did you figure out? Because, like, you know, what the, you know, I, I had a group of friends, and we would watch, you know, tapes from Japan and everything like that. But the Calgary tapes, I mean, that was one of the things that we would once a month. I'd get a tape, and it'd be you know, four shows. So before Owen Hart main events, this is the first year he was wrestling with, with his brother-in-law Ben Basarab and Hase, and you know, the, you you were there mm -hmm. at that, that era. Yeah. Um, when did? You know, and, and he was, you know, he started, and he was in the main events, I don't know, like, right away. He was the top guy right away. He was, um, I mean, he was so talented. Did, did you ever watch, like, wrestling with him, like, of, whether it's Dynamite? Because I, I would watch him and go, you know, he, he's emulating uh, Tiger Mask and Dynamite Kid mm -hmm. and, and Brett. And, and but, but I could watch him and go, like, this guy has studied, but he's also a natural at this. Did, did, what was the point when... Did you figure out how good he was right away, or, or when did you kind of figure out, oh, you know, he's pretty damn good at this thing? 
<laughs> well, he, um, he, like I mentioned, he was a natural athlete. He was good at, at all sports. So he, you know, and then on top of it, having um, been, you know, raised in a wrestling family, they had a big um, wrestling ring in the back garden. And uh, so, you know, you could, he could go and practice and stuff too, but he, he was a real natural athlete and he was very acrobatic. And so that really helped his style. And um, I, I remember watching um, tapes with him of Tiger Mask. And, and he was just, he was a Japanese wrestler that I think he was sort of the first that did this incredible flying, you know, yeah. style and um, so entertaining to watch. And, and so, and I, because Owen was so acrobatic, um, then he could emulate that style, and he really liked that. And he had incredible matches against um, Hassey, who is just a sweet, a very sweet guy on top of being, like, an exceptional athlete, too, who right now is a senator in Japan. Yep. So Actually, he's, um, actually he's, in the, he's actually now in the cabinet, in Abe, Shinzo oh Abe's cabinet. So he's I'm like not the, surprised. The Minister of well, he, Sports, Education, Technology, uh, I forget uh, all of them, but those are three of wow. them. I mean, he's, he's, he's a real yeah. major guy in the uh, Japanese yeah. political world. You know, I'm not surprised at all because Hasty was a really bright guy. And so, you know, and he and Owen were good friends. And so they had really great matches. And, um, I, you know, I was lucky enough to get to go uh, with Owen a couple of times to Japan. I understand you have a uh, pro wrestling tea store with uh, new Owen Hart t-shirts. Yes, exactly. No, I do. Um, sorry, that was my, you heard that beeping. That was just my daughter calling. <laughs> so um, sorry about that. But um, yeah, we uh, were really, really thrilled that, uh, you know, for the longest time, we, um, we, there was no merchandise on Owen because everything filtered through the WWE. And of course, you know, I refused to do anything with, um, with them and, and have any products with them. Uh, you know, I don't want them to make a penny off of Owen. And, you know, I, I don't know if you're aware, but I had like another issue with them where they were uh, selling all of this like tapes and things of Owen and we actually, unfortunately, had another lawsuit against them that lasted three years where, you know, they were selling stuff behind my back. And so then, um, you know, it just was uh, left such a distaste and, like, I just never even entertained the thought of having merchandise of Owen because I always was thinking it had to be linked with the WWE. So, so this is really great. I, and I didn't realize, like, how much wrestling... Um, has evolved and that there are different um, companies that can produce things and so anyway that was all thanks to the dark side of the ring and vice media who we've worked together to create these commemorative um, Owen Hart t-shirts and um, so it's I'm really glad for the fans because there there hasn't been any merchandise and, and you know for obvious reasons but now we can change that and we can at least let them have like a t-shirt and, and, and it's nice because all the proceeds go to the Owen Hart Foundation and the t-shirts are beautiful and they all come with a, a certificate of authenticity um, so you know that it's an official um, Owen Hart Foundation t-shirt and it's really nice because they can celebrate Owen and they can know that all the proceeds are going to go to the Owen Hart Foundation and that with that those funds we will do exceptional work in the community so I think it's such a win-win and and like I said you know Owen loved his fans and the fans were amazing to him so it's really nice because that was always the sad part for me that the fans were left out in the cold and there was really nothing I could do about it because I just didn't want to work with the WWE and have them profit 
off of Owen's death. And so, yeah, I'm just, I'm so excited. And, and like, I was so happy with um, uh, Ryan, who runs the, like, the company. And they've just been so lovely to me. And they've created just the most beautiful T-shirts. Like, I just am so pleased with them. So they've uh, they, they've used the, the our picture that we used from our own heart foundation of Owen, which is my favorite picture of Owen, actually. Um, it's, it's a painting, but it's from a real picture that of him, you know, in the ring. And, and uh, so I don't know. That, it's just my favorite picture. And so I'm glad that people are going to be wearing it and, and helping us, too. That's really nice. Was there a situation, and I'm trying to remember, because, again, this goes back 15, 20 years, and there's so many details of your legal battle that I remember, and um, one of them was, wasn't there some legal strategy involving royalties in the middle of that case where they wanted you to accept royalties as a way to somehow weaken your case? Am I remembering something wrong? or Something something along those lines. Yeah, they were, what they were doing, it wasn't royalties, they were sending um, checks. They were sending um, Owen's sort of paychecks and, um, and in, a, in a way of like sort of weakening our case. Like I never accepted any of the checks, but um, I, I think that was sort of like a strategy, right? That if I was accepting the wages, like kept taking the checks that I can't remember exactly what the details were, but there was something to that effect that it would have been a negative for me um, to take th- those checks because Owen, had, he, he was gone already, you know, so, and I never took one of them. So, um, yeah, I know there were just, there were so many of these little details that were always trying to undercut me and undermine me and, you know, it, it was just, yeah, it was such a, a terrible time. And, you know, and I, I'm so grateful. I know we kind of mentioned with my kids and everything, but, um, you know, I had, the, I personally had the best mom <laughs> who was so great to me and my sister Virginia, who just were just pillars of, um, you know, strength and, and helped me too. So that's, uh, you know, it's, it's a blessing when you have solid people in your life. You know, again, you, you were living a, a life, normal life, you know, your normal routine, and then this week comes up and you're doing a lot of media and it's bringing back all of these different memories and everything like that. I mean, how, how has this week been for you? Mm, yeah, it's it's been mixed emotions for sure. Um, but at the same time, I'm really happy that, you know, like I said, it's a story that should have been told a long time ago. And, you know, for all those reasons that I gave earlier, um, it, it wasn't possible. And now I feel like people really are going to know the true story behind it. And I, I think they'll have a real understanding where I stand, why I've never wavered. I've always had my true convictions and just wasn't willing to budge, you know. And I think people will really know that now. They'll understand why. And I think they'll be supportive and they'll, they'll see, you know, um, what really happened and that that's important it's important to know the facts and now let's move forward did did you were you surprised at all that the wwe actually responded to some of the stuff because um i mean i i I was taken aback just because more because of the timing of it not that it wouldn't happen at some point but when it happened i was like whoa i can't believe they're doing that this week I know. And that's where, too, I, I wasn't surprised, like I said, you know, in my response that they would trot out their legal counsel, Jerry McDivitt, um, because it's really damning for the, the company, for people to hear this stuff. They, they've tried to keep a lid on it for a long time. And when people hear what actually happened, you know, it, it doesn't reflect well on the company and also, too, as I mentioned, you know, um, Linda McMahon, she was the uh, acting CEO at the time when Owen died. And, you know, she is uh, has quite a few ties with the with President Donald Trump and his administration. So I'm sure they're not pleased about that either. But like I said, you know, the truth has always been my defense. And, and I, I'm not here to bash anybody. I'm not here to you know, try to hurt anybody. Um, but I'm really glad that finally my story could be told because it, it never has been in in this 
sort of platform and um, and I'm sure they're just they're worried about the impact it will have when when you were doing the suit um, you know one of the things that I guess was controversial and this is from their end was that you did that you didn't when you did the suit I guess Lumar you know the people who made the um, mm-hmm. the shackle you, you did not yeah. and they ended up WWE ended up suing them um, mm-hmm. which was a, another unique aspect of the story in the sense that yeah. Uh, WWE ended up getting you know, pretty much most of their costs in a settlement from their insurance company. But yeah. um, you, made, you made the decision you know, to, to sue WWE and not the Shackle Company, even though the, the Shackle Company, you know, obviously, yeah. um, you know, I mean, WWE was, you know, it was their decision. Yeah. All of those things that happened happened because of WWE. But right. the Shackle was also the thing that failed, so there is that aspect of it too. So, okay. you know, was there any yeah. specific reason for this, or? Yes. Well, okay. So, um, so when we, you know, embarked on the lawsuit, we we did have Lumar. We were suing Lumar. We were we sued everybody. You know, you put everybody into the lawsuit. This right. is a even you know, what lawyers city, you know, do, right? Yeah. Yeah, they they kind of like cover all the bases. And then once you start investigating, you let people out of the lawsuit. It's like, oh, okay, well, now we've kind of checked. And and these guys, like, you know, there's no liability here. So you let them out. And so what was happening in the lawsuit was that that was the process. That, you know, we were learning. We were doing depositions. We were, you know, we we deposed um, the riggers. We had, had... um, had affidavits from every top rigging company and person in the business. WWE had no one, not a single rigger would stand up on their behalf at all. They were a hundred percent on our side. And, um, so then as the process was going, uh, like I'd mentioned, like the the, um, the harness that they used for Owen, it wasn't meant for suspending people. It was meant for dragging people. So it wasn't that the harness had failed. Um, it was inappropriate how they used it. But the harness itself didn't fail, right, even though it was cutting off the circulation. like Because it wasn't meant for that purpose. And the Lumar clip... Um, is a sailboat clip. It's not meant for human use at all. It's a, it's a, they sell it. It's a sailboat clip. It's sold on sailing sites. And so the clip itself didn't fail. It wasn't meant for humans to begin with. And, and then there was the ropes as well. So the company that, that um, designed the ropes as well. So there were three um, equipment manufacturers that were in our lawsuit. And as we went through, we decided that, you know what, none of these um, companies uh, were at fault because their equipment was fine. It was just used inappropriately. The problem with Lumar was like, unlike the other two manufacturers, they had $50 million of insurance money. And so when we let them out of the lawsuit, oh, that was just, you know, the WWE couldn't believe it because, um, you know, they were like, why would you let them out? They have all this insurance money. But what they didn't realize was that I didn't care about the money. I wouldn't have taken one cent from Lumar because they were not responsible for Owen's death. Their clip was meant for the sole use of sailboats. It was never meant to rig people and they weren't guilty. So I let them out because I didn't want money. I was going to trial. I wanted, you know, accountability. I wanted the guilt to lie where it should. And it wasn't with Lumar. So then when WWE, when they, when we settled our case, they went after Lumar for money to to reclaim some of the money and Lumar settled with them, but they made sure that in the settlement that they took no responsibility for Owen's death and the WWE agreed to that. So they didn't care because all they care about is money and that's all they cared about before, during, after, and to this day. So, you know, this is, this is the story behind the, you know, all the equipment and the reason why we let them out and the reason why WWE went after them. They didn't go after the guys that made the the harness. Why not? Because you know what? They didn't have any money. So there was no insurance money with the harness company. There was no insurance money with the ropes company. 
they only cared about Lumar because they had insurance money. When it comes to the city of Kansas City, did they ever explain to you, like, why they didn't just take over at that moment? You know, because, you know, like mm-hmm. you talked about on the show, and it's been talked about for 20 years, there was a death right there. And, and yeah. you know, this, you know, you know, they, what, what, you know where I'm going, because you've talked about it already. Well, you know, I don't know why, um, like, the police weren't called right away and that they didn't, like, shut everything down and investigate. And But they, there was a criminal investigation after, and it wasn't that they didn't think that criminal charges could, couldn't be filed. They, You know, I talked to the prosecutor, and, you know, as you know, um, taxpayers pay when... when um, when trials happen, and so they just didn't feel like they had a high enough um, sort of percentage of conviction. Like they, I guess they only take cases if they think they have a 90% rate of conviction, and they didn't think it quite met that bar. So that's why they weren't able to sort of prosecute on a criminal level. But that didn't affect our civil case at all. So, and it wasn't like they didn't think they were weren't guilty of something. It was just that they didn't know if they could get a conviction. Two things, Martha. Um, one, to the fans listening right now, how would you like them to remember your husband? And two, what can fans do to honor the legacy and the memory of Owen Hart? Well, you know, um, I, I, I'm i happy that they came to know Owen as the wrestler. And I think what um, this whole episode has shown them is just the other side behind the curtain the man and you know which was even better than the wrestling persona so now I think they have the full picture and so I would hope you know um, I always think give credit where it's due and remember him for the tremendous athlete that he was and the great wrestler that he was and I encourage people to you know honor him and watch his matches and enjoy like all that you know the entertainment that he provided but when you do just remember that the person behind that persona was uh equally if not more amazing and that he was really just the kindest person um and i i told this story uh to to chris jericho that you know owen was always so philanthropic and you know he supported a lot of charities he was he was really involved with the the children's hospital he would go and visit terminally ill kids he would go do speeches at schools um he supported special olympics you know so he was always doing sort of like um organizational charitable events but then he also just you know out of the blue would he was just always trying to help people no matter what it was the guy broken down on the side of the road pull over help him change a tire you know push the car out of the way um or if he just saw someone down and out you know he always willing to help and there was one story that was just remarkable that um he was checking out of his hotel and and he he saw this homeless guy and he'd He'd had the room, like he was going to have the room for like until the next day or something like that. I don't know how it worked, but he went to the guy and he said, listen, here's my room key. Go, go have, you know, use my room. Go have a shower, have a good sleep in the bed. There's pizza in the fridge. Just don't break anything. And, you know, so he gave him his room. And it's, it, those were the kinds of things that he, he would do. And the other thing, too, you know, I think why... Uh, even though he wasn't like a lot of the the wrestlers, like he wasn't he wasn't a drinker and he he just was different, you know. But they, I think they loved him so much because he didn't care, you know. He was just so accepting of everybody. He um, he 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 just accepted people at face value. He never judged anybody. It was like, you know, live your life how you want to. This is how I live my life. Accept me, and I accept you too. He just was always trying to lead by example, and you know. Um, but like accepted everybody just at face value so they never felt like he judged them or you know it just wasn't like that he was just accepting and 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 helpful like if he could help you he would help you and even one time I remember um you know someone really like did something wrong to him and and then he 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 went and he got their kids 
tickets to the show or something. And I said to him, you know, why would you do that? Because, you know, wasn't that guy just terrible to you? And he said, yeah, I know. He said, but, you know, it's not the kid's fault. And so, like that was just, just like he was so wise, you know, and he could just see he was so reflective and he could see things that other people couldn't see. And he always found the value somehow in people and just always was spinning things to the good, you know, um, which was something that uh, a gift that he, he left for me too. And so, so that's what I hope people remember and they can honor him. Like I said, like enjoy his matches. Um, and if you want to help the foundation, you know, um, all, all donations get a tax receipt. And if you want to buy a t-shirt and, and celebrate Owen along with us in this episode and, and know the truth, what really happened, and know that all the proceeds are going to the Owen Hart Foundation, all for the good. And then that's that's how you can celebrate them. And that's sort of my motto, you know, in life is like everything for the good. So not that everything that happens to you in life is good, but just try to find the good in what happens to you and leave the rest. Martha, I want to thank you so much for this. Is there a social platform where fans can connect with the Owen Hart Foundation? We have our Owen Hart Foundation website. We also have Facebook. We have Twitter. We have Instagram. Um, and then, of course, I have my movie blog. And, I, and you know, and I do try my best um, to respond. Um, and, you know, like people just need to give me a bit of time to catch up, but, you know, they can reach out and there's lots of um, platforms and social media where they can reach us and send us their, you know, their comments or whatever they want to do. And that would be lovely. Dave and Brian will be back tonight with another Wrestling Observer Radio. Dr. Martha Hart, thank you so much for your time and being so generous. Yeah, oh, and much. thank you.